Hello everyone, welcome to 2022's CubeCon Europe. Here is the signaled intro at the deep dive talk. My name is Dang Chen. I am a software engineer from Google and the current work on the GKE and Ansos. I'm the one of the founding engineer for Kubernetes and the initiated uh, uh, signal back in 2016. Derek? Yeah, uh, great to be here with everybody at KubeCon again. Uh, my name is Derek Carr. I am a um, engineer at Red Hat, uh, working on uh, our OpenShift product, uh, and have been with Don and the SIGs uh, since our early days as well. And I'm excited to be here with uh, some of our newer contributors, Alana and Sergey. So, Alana, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Alana Hashman. I currently work on the OpenShift Engineering Node team. Uh, I've been working on Kubernetes since about 2018, uh, and you might recognize me as the co-chair of SIG Instrumentation, uh, but I also work in SIG Node and currently help lead the CI sub-project with Sergey. Hello, I'm Sergey Kanjelev. I'm working for Google and uh, very excited to be here. Um, so with that said, back to you, Don. Next. So before we get into the today's agenda, I want to briefly mention the previous signal, the update we made at the KubeCon last year. Uh, you can access the Unity Slides record by click all those links here. Next. Here's the today's agenda. We are going to first introduce the signal's responsibility. Then we are going to talk about the current activity since last updates, the roadmaps from uh, one 1.23 to the to the 1.25 and beyond. Then some interesting projects and efforts currently driving by the signal. For example, 1.24 Docker share removal, SQL provision two, and the CI projects continue from the last update. Then we want to share the node contributor ladder with the community. We discussed this within the signal community for a while. Now we have finalized yet. Finally, we are going to talk about how to get involved and how to get help from the community. Next. What is the SIG node and its responsibility? Let's briefly talk about the node responsibility in Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a cluster orchestration solution for containerized applications and services. Those containers include of the Kubernetes controllers are running on the nodes on each node, there is an agent called Kubernetes. Kubernetes registered the node to Kubernetes master. Kubernetes, together with Container Runtime, manages pod and containers lifecycle on the node. Set up, run, tear down, and clean up. Kubernetes also does the node level resource management, such as ensure the application gets the request resources, detects the node level resource starvation issues, and take the, takes action to prevent out of resource situation. Kubernetes also sends the status back to the control plan to make the follow decision correction. Next, please. In summary, Signal owns all control uh, controllers running on the nodes, which ensure the node itself and the application running happily. Signal is very large and owns many projects. You can click the links. Uh, here to find more. I this time I want to specially call out the new sub project we started lately, special resource operator, which helps the user manage the deployment of the kernel modules and the drivers, and uh, come to join our signal the uh, uh, weekly meeting to know all those projects in details. Now I want to hand over to Anila to talk about our roadmap. Thanks, Don. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about all the sorts of things that we've been up to in the past year, uh, starting with graduations and deprecations. Uh, so I grouped this section together because there's sort of this overall goal between graduations and deprecations of cleaning up tech debt, re uh, reducing uh, maintenance service. Uh, so when a feature graduates in Kubernetes, uh, it was previously behind a feature flag, typically defaulted to on, uh, and when we graduate it, we get rid of that feature flag. It's no longer conditionally on. It's on for everyone by default. 
Um, similarly, deprecations uh, are when we uh, will disable a feature uh, if it was behind a feature gate and ultimately remove that feature uh, from the code base, again, making it a little bit more simpler to maintain. Uh, so over the past year, uh, probably our most major uh, user-facing uh, removal uh, was that of Docker shim, which was finally removed in the 124 release. Um, on the uh, graduation side, uh, we are also graduating uh, C group V2 or the version two of kernel control group groups uh, to feature parity in the 122 release. Uh, and then a couple more minor deprecations and graduations. Uh, we've removed support for dynamic kubelet config uh, that was previously deprecated and ultimately removed in 124. Uh, and we've also graduated pod overhead, uh, which helps keep track of additional resources at the pod level. So no more feature gate for that. Uh, for beta graduations, this is when a feature may have been added at an alpha level, and now we default that feature gate to on. So in the past uh, couple of releases, 123 and 124, we've graduated a number of features to beta, uh, including ephemeral containers, uh, which had quite a long time uh, between alpha and beta. So we're very excited about that. Uh, but we also uh, graduated uh, the kubelet CRI support. Uh, we now support a V1 API, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, we have graduated kubelet credential provider to beta and uh, we've added uh, support for and then graduated grpc probes to beta uh, and so on so uh, if you want to look up any of these particular features uh, you can do so uh, by enhancement number which i've included on the slide and uh, in the copy of the slides that we're sharing we'll also include some links uh, finally, I'll talk about the alpha features that we've uh, added to the SIG over the past couple of releases. Uh, these are net new features, so they're introduced behind a feature gate, uh, but those feature gates are disabled by default and you can turn them on and test them out. Uh, we have a couple of these alpha features uh, that we have added. Uh, the first is uh, C advisorless and CRI full pod container and pod stats allowing uh, the CRI, the container runtime, to provide statistics, uh, typically Prometheus metrics, uh, on behalf of a pod, rather than having C advisor have to do some introspection of uh, the C groups and provide them instead, which can be a little expensive. Uh, sort of ultimately along the path of reducing how much we have to rely on C advisor in Kubelet. Uh, we also added some new CPU manager policies, which is very exciting. Now, in our future roadmap, uh, 125 and beyond, we have a bunch of really cool stuff in the pipeline. Uh, we're going to continue enabling uh, C group V2, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit more further in the presentation, uh, which will unblock a lot of new features in Kubernetes, very exciting. Uh, we're adding forensic checkpointing uh, to containers. Uh, we're looking to add uh, secret pulled images and in-place pod updates uh, for adjusting uh, the requested resources at runtime. Uh, and we're also working on uh, graduating memory swap support, which is currently an alpha feature, uh, but not yet graduated to beta. There are, of course, many more features. And if you want to hear more about those, you can join us at a SIG node meeting. Uh, but for now, uh, let's go and do a little deeper dive into one of our major areas. Uh, I believe Don will be talking about Docker shim removal. Over to you, Don. Thanks, Anella. Before getting into Docker shim removal, I want to briefly talk about Kubernetes Container Runtime Interface, CRI. It is a gRPC interface which defines how Kubernetes, the agent running on the every node, interacts with a wide variety of the container runtime. We published the first version of the CRI back in May 2016, and the first implementation of the CRI was introduced to Kubernetes 1.5 in 2017. Next, please. As the first implementation to support the CRI, Docker Shim is the built-in module in Kubernetes. Why did we choose to do this then? So then we have to deprecate and remove it today. In 2016, Docker was the only production-ready container runtime. 
We needed to validate the interface we created quickly to ensure the incremental deployment. It, take, it took us a little bit more than one year to have the first version of the production ready interface and the implementation. Then while we bundle it with Kubernetes as the single battery, back then, Kubernetes iterate very dramatically. CRI was changed all the time. Bundle, bundling it with Kubernetes so that we can tolerate breaking API change for the faster iterations. This also allowed us, we can switch to using CRI as the default uh, for the in-process pro in Docker integration while the API is still in alpha. Hence, we created of the Docker shim. And that, is, that was the only choice for Kubernetes user until two years later, we introduced GA, the second container runtime, container D, then cryo uh, follow. Next, please. Since we published the first version of the CRI, uh, there were many efforts to build different container runtimes to serve different purposes, different workloads, different business reasons, and so on. Signal supported all of them, but worked very closely with ContainerD, Cryo, and Fracti, in addition to Docker Shim, to make sure the interface we defined covers the majority use cases. We also introduced CRI test suite and Cryo Cuttle uh, tool sets to help the develop, development and the usability. Next. Since we published the first version of the trial, oh sorry, since we published the first version of the CRI in 2016, two years later, Kubernetes container D went to GA and graduated from the CF incubation. Later, trial was production ready and graduate. Both container runtimes support the CRI and uh, OCI compatibility since day one. Both the container runtimes are future parity with the Docker shim before GA. And over the time, we introduce more features to them uh, respectively. Both container runtimes met the test coverage requirements defined by Signal before the production ready. Next. Why do we want to remove Docker shim? Why not maintain an inbox solution for the users? Uh, from the previous slides, one can see that uh, since the beginning of its life, we treated, we treated it as the temporary solution. We fixed many integration issues within it to support existing users, but decided not to introduce new features, especially after we had two alternatives three years ago. This is a growing feature in parity's issue uh, with the Docker ship. By the way, the first feature we developed after Docker ship removal, it is a SQL version two. Now I want to hand, hand it over to Derek on SQL version two. Thanks, Don. So as discussed earlier, we've made a lot of progress in the community around SQL suite two enablement. Um, as we started this project, uh, we wanted to make clear on what our initial goals were with respect to Cgroup v2, and that was largely to get parity with existing feature support in Cgroups v1. So all of the um, resource controllers that Kubernetes leverages to uh, restrict the amount of CPU or memory or PIDs or huge pages uh, uh, that a given pod can consume, they are restricted today primarily by Cgroup v1 controllers. Uh, over the life of Kubernetes, Cgroups v2 has continued to evolve uh, and has reached parity uh, features in many cases with V1. So uh, today, if you boot a kubelet on a V2 enabled host and your runtime is uh, set up appropriately, uh, our intention is to ensure that they at least have feature parity today. Uh, we are not deprecating secret V1 support uh, by adding V2, but we are making a statement that uh, new resource controllers uh, are intended to be only added for, for V2 only. And we'll talk about some of those. So. Um, one of the major uh, activities to enable V2 support besides the code is just to make sure that you have viable test coverage. Uh, a number of distributions over the last few years have started to change their default uh, boot time configuration to be V2 enabled. Uh, so that includes uh, Fedora, Ubuntu, COS, and others. Um, and now that that's happened, we get more pressure, obviously, in the Kubernetes community to support those hosts. Um, 
one example of new features that we are excited that you can uh, leverage uh, in a V2 environment that is in an alpha state right now is memory quality of service. So um, uh, hopefully as we continue to uh, evolve that feature, we can uh, point to that as our first V2 uh, specific C groups enablement support. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, what does a secret V2 environment mean for you as a workload deployer? Uh, typically, you shouldn't have to worry about it, right? You should leverage uh, Kubernetes as your container orchestration runtime to say that that's going to handle it for me. I just set my fields on my pods and everything's great. Uh, as a uh, Kubernetes infrastructure provider, it does have some meaning, right? You have to know if your operating system is configured for V2. You have to make sure that your container runtime supports a V2 environment. And typically that does mean now you'd have to change how you deploy a secret manager in both Kubelet and your runtime to be systemd aware. Um, in practice though, uh, while it's true that most workloads shouldn't be impacted, it's hard for us to immediately know these things without testing and feedback. Um, so whether you get Kubernetes from the community, you get it from a vendor, or you get it from uh, your particular provider of choice, please make sure you give that feedback to that source so that we can get that uh, any bugs and issues known to the broader community and fixed up. A good example of where Secret Suite 2 and uh, stuff that's not provided in the core of the Kubernetes project often intersect is around things like security monitoring resource agents. Um, so while projects like C-Advisor have added V2 support, your own unique environment might have some unique uh, agents running on your environment that may not yet be V2 compatible. So just be aware uh, that the intersection of your total set of solutions deployed to a node might um, need to account for V2 in the future. So if we go to the next slide, uh, just wanted to raise some domain specific or industry specific challenges that we are aware of as uh, Kubernetes maintainers, uh, that as we look to evolve towards V2, uh, we hear feedback about. Um, a lot of users in telco are using Kubernetes as a platform to automate uh, uh, new networks. One area that we know is not available in uh, Secret Suite 2 was allowing you to disable CPU load balancing, for example. So a lot of people in those industries are, are pinning their workload to particular CPUs and are very performance sensitive. Um, we are hoping in the broader Linux community that we get these things fixed uh, and so that V2 will just work fine in those industries. Uh, but that's an example of a domain or industry specific challenge that is hard for us to know without feedback. Other types of challenges are uh, more nuanced. So if you're using a particular language runtime, uh, in Golang, there's native V1 support uh, to determine how to properly configure uh, GoMax procs. Uh, but right now, uh, my understanding is I think on Golang, you actually have to manually set that on a V2 host. Uh, I'm sure over time as Golang uh, evolves, you won't have to care about that anymore, but sometimes these quirks exist. Similarly on Java, if you're using newer JDKs greater than 15, Java should be V2 aware and not need any additional work. But if your company or your environment is older on an older JDK, uh, you might need to update in order to take advantage. Uh, finally, we're doing a lot of work in uh, Signode to try to be more flexible with respect to auto scaling. So we talked about in place uh, resource resizing in our roadmap. Uh, right now we are working towards landing that in an alpha feature state, uh, but we would love uh, help to be able to ensure that as that feature lands, that it is V2 tolerant. Uh, right now there's gaps uh, that we need to close. Uh, in particular around auto scaling, a lot of things between V1 and V2, the metrics do change. And so if you have exotic auto scalers, um, we really just need more testing against those metric providers that are feeding your auto scaling and that feedback brought back to the community. So like a general call to action if you're watching this is if your domain, your industry, your language runtime, or your vendor has any known gaps that they wanna share with us, the only way we can get them mitigated is to, to share that feedback. So please do look to join us. Going forward though with Secret 2 there are interesting uh, uh, features that we look to uh, explore uh, that are, if you're interested to you as a potential user or contributor, we'd love to learn more about. So things like pressure stall information metrics to drive more efficient uh, eviction or node reliability is an exciting feature for us, as well as better leveraging uh, user space um killers like MD. So uh, hopefully we see that as we evolve to V2, we can get better, more reliable nodes uh, for the broader community. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, talking through uh, reliability, sometimes regressions happen. Uh, so uh, 
to speak through this next section. Uh, I think, Sergey, are you next? Yeah, I'm next. I'm going to talk about uh, new regressions that we discovered in uh, Kublet uh, in 122. It's a continuation of a story that uh, Elana told us last time. Uh, we did a similar talk uh, on KubeCon. So if you're interested for the beginning of story, go back and listen it first. Uh, or you can just continue here and then go back and uh, see what other issues uh, we caught when we've been doing that. Um, so it's not the only regression we found, and uh, but it's uh, pretty quite interesting one. Um, so to start talking about this regression, I want to refresh a little bit about architecture of Kublet. Uh, Kublet receives signals from API server and it also uh, uh, reports status back to API server. Um, so there is this connection and then uh, Kublet also talks to container runtime through workers and it's like uh, a schedule spot and uh, queues them when needed. Uh, plus it monitors um, pod status uh, periodically uh, querying container runtime information and uh, this uh, information about pods being generated as events in the uh, uh, plug and this events being fed back into Kublet so it uh, processes all that from all the signals from all the different components to build up a final picture of what is currently happening with pods and containers in the pods. In 122, oh, let me Next slide. In 122, we um, fixed a bug. Uh, that bug was uh, related to uh, reporting the terminated status of uh, uh, certain containers. There was uh, some race conditions, and uh, to eliminate these conditions, we uh, put um, more logic together uh, as a single source of truth of uh, pod termination status. Uh, as I said last time, there were many race conditions and uh, other bugs we discovered as a result of this. Um, uh, refactoring. It was a good refactoring, it fixed a lot of bugs, but uh, and then regression was caught and we shipped quite a stable product. Unfortunately, we found another problem in uh, Kubelet in 122. So this uh, was um, represented as uh, out of CPU message when you try to schedule many pods simultaneously on quite busy nodes. Uh, examples may be uh, jobs that you execute. Each job is quite uh, small, uh, but you need to execute a lot of them. And uh, when new job trying to, to be scheduled, it suddenly cannot be scheduled and uh, receives this message out, out of CPU. We discovered this bug through uh, a bug triage relatively uh, uh, early. Uh, unfortunately, due to the nature of this bug, we saw similar situations with out of CPU before that was caused, for instance, by static pods. When uh, static pod uh, being scheduled uh, uh, while uh, API server doesn't know about it, and then uh, API server will push some nodes, uh, some pods into the node, and uh, node will not have time, uh, will not have CPU because uh, static pod just got scheduled and API server just, was, just wasn't aware of that. There were other cases uh, caused out, out of CPU before. So we investigated, we thought that uh, it may be some scheduler problem. It might be some uh, rare issues that uh, nobody caught. And most uh, biggest reason that we didn't have this caught and uh, we didn't know about this regression, that we don't have many tests that uh, test many fails, uh, um, many ports are uh, scheduling uh, and uh, rescheduling uh, often. So, what we did. Um, the fix was quite simple for this one. Um, for this uh, situation, oh, I didn't explain what the root cause. So root cause was that uh, uh, when we fixed the port termination uh, detection and uh, we put it in single place, we made uh, Kublet know about port being terminated earlier than before. And uh, since Kublet knows about it, it will sync the status with API server and API server will know that pod is terminated. So it's time to schedule a new pod in, in place of this one. Uh, what uh, the fix was to delay reporting the status to API server. Uh, I highlighted this uh, like key uh, codes that uh, uh, participate in that fix, but the uh, PR was much bigger than that. So, um, now we will delay reporting terminated status of a pod to uh, API server uh, and before all the resources are cleaned up. Uh, and uh, all the resources, I mean, not all, all resources, it's only CPU and memory in this case. Um, 
we uh, made some observations while we've been fixing these bugs uh, beyond just uh, the distributed systems are hard and uh, we need to find balance between speed and consistency. We also uh, highlighted again that terminated port is not equal to deleted port. Uh, terminated port uh, can report its termination, but it still will clean up some resources. And one resource in particular that uh, will be uh, cleaning uh, will be uh, turned down during the termination period is uh, volumes. And volumes may take a lot of time to, uh, to be uh, turned down um, and um, Kublet account for that. So a uh, new port can be scheduled that want to use the same volume and it will wait till volume will be completely cleaned up and then we will pick, it, pick up a new volume. So this behavior is different from what we made uh, for CPU and memory. And in the future, we may, may consider improving this for CPU and memory as well. So scheduling will uh, happen faster and uh, Kubelet will just wait a little bit for CPU and memory to uh, finally free up, but it may be a future improvement. Uh, it all highlighted again that uh, we need to have good CI uh, for uh, Kubernetes and uh, make sure that we cover all the bases when we uh, test it. So we uh, added end-to-end -end tests for this uh, regression that will uh, schedule many ports and will make sure that uh, uh, this uh, uh, signal wouldn't be, uh, terminated signal wouldn't be synced up with APIs or too early. Uh, in general, CI subproject uh, meet every week, and uh, what we do is uh, we look at all the test grid. We analyze what's happening, what is going badly, what is going good. Um, we uh, fix issues and adjust uh, tests, and we also create a new test coverage. So uh, if you're interested to join Signot and you don't know where to start, the CI subproject may be a very good place to start. Uh, we You will learn Kubernetes through testing Kubernetes and uh, uh, it will give you a lot of uh, inside knowledge like how to test and what kind of situation Kubelet may get into. Um, we recently published achievements blog post. Uh, I linked it here. You can go and check it out. Uh, we have 18 active contributors that we highlighted. We really appreciate all of your work. Uh, we want uh, to highlight it more and more. Uh, and we don't have time in this talk to uh, name names, but uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for your contribution. I um, also posted some uh, statistics here. It's not, uh, I mean, it's from some time ago and it's kind of vanity metric. It just, uh, but what it shows, it shows the numbers. Like we do a lot of work, we do reviews, we do uh, bug fixes. So um, if you're interested, join us and uh, uh, help us in this uh, hard task. We also, uh, like this is how we track work in the CI sub project. We have a special project for test and we do receive early reliability signal by uh, doing bug triage. With that, I want to go to Derek uh, to talk about how uh, people uh, contributing uh, to Signot can uh, get more exposed into what we're doing. Yeah, thanks, Sergey. So uh, one of the challenges in a open source project at the scale of uh, Kubernetes and Signode itself is just the the breadth of things uh, that we need to keep in mind as maintainers, uh, that we don't break or regress uh, the past, and we can continue to build responsibly for the future. So Signode is uh, the third largest SIG by absolute workload. Um, lots of PRs get opened, lots of PRs need to get merged, closed, and triage, and contributions can come from a variety of uh, member companies who uh, work in the community. Uh, sometimes uh, enduring and sometimes just uh, uh, in particular feature or function areas. Uh, what this means is in general for us as a project to be healthy, uh, we need to have a constant pool of, of help uh, to help drive that work forward. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, one of the things that we're trying to do in the Signo community is to ensure that we have a viable set of healthy new contributors, reviewers, and a pathway for approvers going forward. Um, uh, hopefully by the time you are watching this in KubeCon, we will have a, a PR that's merged uh, in the uh, Signode, uh, I think the community area is where we're looking to put it, uh, where you can look through new guidelines on how we want to help encourage a clear pathway to evolution of um, responsibility within the SIG, uh, to uh, set guidelines for reviewers and approvers, and then expectations for those who become approvers with respect to uh, uh, maybe making clear uh, their individual domain knowledge. One of the concerns we have as a Kubernetes project, and particularly in the kubelet, is it's kind of an intersection point between 
um, many other aspects of the project. So that would be networking and uh, storage. Uh, and our code isn't always as decoupled as we'd like from those two intersection areas. Uh, and so particularly for the pathway for approvers, uh, things like security and knowing what to look at are of strong uh, paramount importance. Um, so uh, if you wanna help evolve your contributions in SIGNode, uh, the CISL project is a great place to get started, but just help join us at SIGNode and hopefully we can get you moving forward in that path. Um, next slide. So Alana, do you wanna talk about how folks can get involved? Yeah, let's do it. So uh, we often talk about our contribution priorities and this sort of draws back to a few of the things I said about roadmap. Uh, we try to prioritize stability first. Uh, we want to ensure that text tests are fixed. We want to ensure that bugs are fixed and open triage issues are fixed. And we want to do that before we start working on new features because otherwise we might get overwhelmed uh, in the number of uh, bugs and uh, test breakage that we're working on. Uh, we really, it's important to us to ensure that our test infrastructure monitoring and health is good and you know our tests are green. We have good signal to work with. So. This is sort of how we prioritize uh, contributions. And uh, if you really want uh, your new contributions to get looked at, uh, you are more likely to get a positive response uh, if you are fixing something that's broken uh, initially versus like, I have this great new feature because I'm, we're sure that your feature is great, but we have so many great features that uh, it might not be the best place to start because there might be something broken blocking that. Uh, and so, uh, uh, optimizations uh, are also great uh, to include uh, that improve the performance of existing components. Um, other areas that you might be interested in contributing, uh, and I often try to call this out, especially to folks who might be using the kubelet, have uh, opinions on uh, SIGNode, uh, but aren't necessarily going to write code. Uh, you can still contribute, you can still help us out. Uh, either by doing performance testing or writing documentation uh, or giving us feedback on logging and metrics and how we can improve that or just helping us triage and keep on top of PRs and issues. You don't have to write code in order to contribute to the SIG. Uh, so we welcome all forms of contribution. So how do you contribute? Well, first, uh, it helps to join our SIG meetings so you get an idea of what we're currently working on. Uh, at the main meetings of the SIG, we talk about uh, major features that are being worked on, uh, enhancements, and what's going into a given release and milestone, uh, high priority bugs, and more. Um, if that seems kind of intimidating uh, to join when there are 40 plus people in a meeting, uh, you could try coming to our CI and triage sessions uh, where we have a smaller, more hands-on group uh, and we work directly uh, on uh, specific bugs, specific issues, that kind of thing. Uh, as I said previously, you can also participate in uh, uh, code reviews, issues, documentation. Uh, this is all awesome. Uh, big shout out to all of the folks who've been helping out with the Docker shim removal documentation this release. That was an enormous effort and uh, a great help to SIGNode. Uh, and it's also really great if you adopt features, uh, turn on alpha feature gates and let us know how they work. So where can you find us? Uh, this slide links to our regular meeting, uh, which is currently scheduled on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Our CI triage meeting is every week on Wednesday at the same time, 10 a.m. Pacific. We have a Slack channel, pound SIG node on the Kubernetes Slack. Uh, we also have a mailing list, the Kubernetes SIG node mailing list on Google Groups. Uh, and our current chairs are Don and Derek. Thanks so much for attending this talk.